This week we're off to Bolivia to meet the son of one of our favourite producers. My name is Steve Layton and I travel the world finding amazing and delicious coffee for you to drink at home. Some make coffee difficult to understand and complicated, but here it's my job to make it easy and fun and tell you what's in my mug. So the name of this coffee and the producer might sound a little familiar. Bebeto, Beto for short, is the son of the legend that is Tadasio Mamani. Tadasio, who owns Finca Canton Uanese, uh, which is a farm we've worked with since 2012. His farm is located in 18 de Mayo, which is a pre municipality of Carinavi and part of Canton Uanese, where his dad's farm's also located. Lots of farms get called a variation of these names because it's not very traditional to kind of give your farm a name. If you think of like David Vilka, it's called Finca David Vilka. Um, this is the second year of working with Bebeto and it's the second year that he's grown the coffee under his own guardianship. So it's kind of good that he's let his daddy's letting go and letting him actually produce the coffee himself. And the results are amazing, but super different to his dad's coffee considering they're neighbours and in the same region. The coffee is a mixture of red and yellow uh, Tipica with a little bit of Keturah and Katai in there for good measure. Uh, Bebeto uses the depulpa of his father's to remove the cherry and then leaves the coffee in a dry fermentation for around about 16 to 18 hours. Then it goes through the scrubber section of the pulpa to remove the final mucilage and then he transfers it to African raised beds where it's dried between seven and nine days and then it's delivered to the mill in Karanavi. They use a special picking method, which is called Anya, which is exactly the same as his father used, so I can't imagine where he learnt it from. But this method involves selectively picking, not strip picking like everybody else uh, in the area does. Uh, this demands much more labour, incurs much more higher costs, but it means that Bebeto gets a better coffee that he can sell to people like us, and we're willing to pay a little bit more money than uh, lots of the other people who want that stripped process will do. So I'm really excited to present it to you and uh, let's go on to the next bit. So this week we're going to try something a little bit different. Now on the website you'll have seen that I have cupping scores and those cupping scores are derived from the Cup of Excellence score sheet that I use to give a coffee a final number um, that kind of measures it somewhere on what I think its qualities are. Um, the descriptors I have for this coffee are that there's green apple, malted milk biscuit with a hint of gooseberry and a whole load of caramel on the finish. Like, and that is the perfect descriptors for it. But let's look at the scores in depth. So clean cup, what do I mean by a clean cup? Well, a clean cup is transparency. It's are there any roasty or off flavours that are covering it up? And with this coffee, there really isn't. Uh, when I've cupped this coffee, I give this a solid seven. And seven is bordering on excellent. And then we look at the sweetness. Now, sweetness doesn't have to be high or low. It has to be in balance with the cup. Um, and this is, I give this a 6.5. It's not the sweetest cup that I've come across but it does kind of bode well within it. And 6.5 is like better than average. Um, so it's kind of getting towards that excellent side. And then we look at acidity. And again, acidity isn't about, is it in intense acidity or is it muted acidity? Is it in balance with the cup? And this one is very much in balance with the cup, but actually it's quite a powerful acidity as well. So when it comes to the cupping sheet, I gave this a seven. Then we look at mouthfeel. Now this one is very easy to score. Does it cover the mouth? Does it have a viscous feel to it? How much does it make you happy in that mouthfeel department? And for me, this is a little thing. Now when high acidity coffee is there and there's little lower sweetness, it tends to be a lower mouthfeel. But again, I gave this a 6.5. And then we look at the flavour. How powerful are those flavours? Are they cutting through? And for me, the flavour of this is a very clear seven. It's excellent. There are very clear descriptors you can pick out and find in that cupping bowl. And then we go to the aftertaste. How does it leave your mouth afterwards? Well, I've got it ringing round in my mouth at the minute. And it's kind of there, but it's not boom powerful. So again, I've given it a six. Um, and six is an excellent score still. Although this is just average, like... Anything below a six, I'm not going to be buying. Six and above is something that we're, we're going to be interested in. 
And then we look at the balance. How do all these flavours come together? How does it hold together as a cup? And for me, this is a perfectly balanced cup. You have that great sweetness, but it's not over the top. You have this great mouthfeel, but it's not dominant. You have this good acidity. So the balance for this, I gave a seven. And then we look at the overall. This is a chance for me to give it love. So was there something I couldn't quite put my finger on, but I really enjoyed? And for me, I gave this a seven out of eight. So I obviously enjoyed it very much. And then with all those scores, we had plus 36 on it. And then we find our final cup in score. Oh, I love roasting. I'm Roaster Steve. I don't know why I'm talking in a Yorkshire accent, but I'll go back to my normal one. So roasting Bolivians is a little bit more tricky than normal. This is mainly because they say they're washed, but they're not. There's a lot of mucilage that's left on after the pulping process. And so those, the Pagano pulpers that remove the fruit, then scrub the seed in between some bushes that take away the mucilage. Um, and rather than a traditional fermentation, which is underwater, that's used a lot in Africa, this means that you end up with a slightly different cup and have to approach it in a slightly different way to some of those Central Americans. This just needs to be the roaster to be aware of what's happening as they approach the roaster. The other thing that makes Bolivians a little bit harder to roast is the altitude. So you get in a much more denser bean, which means that it takes a lot more heat to get it to where you want it to. So this is me being aware, I'm looking for around about a 12 minute roast time to bring out the hidden acidity of these sweet coffees and then I'm dropping the heat after first crack so I can tease a little bit more sweetness out, a little bit more balance. This is common for most of the Bolivians we roast here at Has Been. Now will you get lost while I carry on roasting? So we've got a little bit of video that we filmed at uh, Beto's father's farm, Tadasio, uh, that I'm going to show you right now. So I've just brewed a French press. If you want to know how to make the perfect French press too, go and watch this video right now. Hello everybody, and welcome to the fifth in the series of the Has Been Brewing Guide. My name is Stephen Layton, and today we're going to be taking a look at the French press, or if you prefer, the cafetiere. The French press is the easiest and cheapest way to make great coffee. First of all, you're going to need some things. A cafetiere. Some coffee, freshly roasted, of course. A grinder. A kettle. Some scales. Now if you'd bought these first time round, you'd be laughing by now. A timer. Two spoons. And of course, a mug. Step one, boil the kettle. Step two, while the kettle is boiling, weigh out your coffee. Now I'm using an eight cup cafetiere, which brews around about 750 ml. So, I'm going to need 56 grams of coffee, but you work it out, 75 grams per litre. Step 3, take the just off the boil water and warm the cafetiere. Step 4, grind the coffee. You're looking for a coarse grit style of grind, much coarser than the other brewing methods we've done before. You want to feel lumps in between those fingers. Step 5, pour away the water from the cafetiere and then place it on the scales. Add the coffee check the weight and tear the scales again. Start your timer, then add 200 ml of water covering all the grinds and leave this for 30 seconds. Step six, after 30 seconds, stir the grinds and add the remaining 550 ml to the brew and leave for a further four minutes. Step seven, while you're waiting, add some hot water to your mug. Remember, cold cup, cold coffee. Step eight, Take one of the spoons and break the crust that's formed on top of the cafetiere, stirring it just the once. Then take the other spoon and remove what grinds you can that remain in the carafe. I've stole this idea from some rather clever coffee people, but if anyone asks, it's all my idea, okay? It does really help though, stopping the extraction carrying on and stop some of those bits getting in your cup. Step nine, put the plunger on top of the brewer and wait 10 to 15 seconds just enough time to heat the spring so it expands a little. Step 10, plunge down and throw away the water that's been warm in your mug. Pour and enjoy. It won't keep long, so drink straight away. Or share it with a friend. 
if you follow these simple steps, you really will get the best out of this bargain basement brewer, and the results can be really worth it. Thank you for watching this guide, and I really hope that you've enjoyed it too. I also hope that you'll take a look at some of the other brew guides that we've done. My name is Steve Layton, and remember, life is too short for bad coffee. So, I hope you enjoyed that brew guide. It's one of my favourites. And actually, you know, the French press is one of my favourites. And I'm here you going, like, why? Because it's the cheapest way to get into specialty coffee. They're easy to brew, they're consistent because of the bigger grind size. Gives you a much more consistent brew, very easy. And if you're in a rush in the morning and you want a coffee before you go to work, you don't want faff. You just want something that you can brew very easily. The downsides are that you get a little bit more texture with it, but the upsides are you get a little bit more texture with it. So um, I don't think you should be afraid of that. Every brew method has something different and brings something different to the coffee. So let's go into the coffee. Mm. And straight away, the big thing I'm getting from this is green apple. It's green apple acidity, it's green apple sweetness. Then it goes into like a little bit of body. So I'm thinking, you know, in malted milk biscuits, like I used to eat a load of them as a kid, because it's creamy, it's sweet, but it's got that kind of multi flavour to it that's mixed in with a little bit of caramel. And then on the back end, you just get a beautiful gooseberry that just comes running through. Um, it's such a complex coffee. Uh, Beto is doing an amazing job with this coffee. Right, thank you for joining me. Uh, always a pleasure. And do remember, life is definitely too short for bad coffee.